The architecti of the Roman army were the ancient world's only professional engineers. Exempt from the normal duties of soldiers, they were trained to design a dazzling array of structures and machines. When on campaign, they constructed catapults, camps, bridges, and siege works. In times of peace, they designed frontier defenses, highways, aqueducts, and much more, all while serving as consultants for civilian projects in nearby cities. Perhaps the most familiar project of Roman military engineering is the marching camp, the temporary fortification that campaigning armies built every night to protect their tents and supplies. Marching camps were laid out by surveyors who traveled ahead of the advancing troops. When they found a level and defensible site, they marked out a rectangular grid of streets and designated places for the general headquarters, stables, kitchens, tents, and latrines. As the soldiers arrived, they began, under the direction of the engineers, to construct the camp's defenses. Using the pickaxes that were part of their standard kit, the soldiers dug a trench around the camp, normally about five feet wide and three deep. Along the inner face of the ditch, a turf rampart about six feet high was erected, topped by a palisade of sharpened stakes. The whole process, from surveying to completion, took only two or three hours. Between camps, the engineers were responsible for overcoming every obstacle in the advancing army's path. They became especially proficient at building bridges. On the banks of a large river, the flatboats carried in the baggage train of every legion were launched, anchored in a row from bank to bank, and connected with planks to form a pontoon bridge. The longest on record, built on a whim by Caligula, extended three miles from Baiae to Puteoli. If the current was exceptionally strong, a more substantial structure was needed. In 55 BC, Julius Caesar ordered his army to bridge the Rhine near the modern city of Koblenz, where the river is about 1,300 feet wide and up to 25 feet deep. The engineers drove pairs of pilings, angled to deflect the force of the water, into the riverbed. Crossed braces were fastened between the pilings, forming trusses that were connected with beams to form a roadway. The entire bridge, from the felling of the first tree to the laying of the last beam, was done in ten days. Although Roman military engineers made few advances on the siege techniques of the Hellenistic era, they excelled at applying those techniques on a grand scale. At Alesia, Julius Caesar's engineers built two spectacular lines of siege works, one encircling the Gallic fort, the other protecting the Roman camps. With their towers, trenches, forts, moats, and ramparts, these totaled some 25 miles in length. More than a century later, legionary engineers constructed a siege ramp nearly 2,000 feet long and 200 feet high to reach the mountaintop stronghold of Masada. Roman military engineers were responsible for even more impressive projects in peacetime, as we'll see after a brief word about this video's sponsor. Private Internet Access, PIA, is a virtual private network, or VPN. A VPN hides your IP address and encrypts your internet connection, protecting your digital life from those who want to exploit your private information. Besides keeping your data safe from hackers, PIA allows you to access region-restricted content from all over the world by changing your geolocation. Believe me, trying to stream Netflix documentaries like Empire Games without PIA is like trying to build a Roman aqueduct without a legionary engineer. I chose PIA over other VPNs because it's available for all platforms and because one subscription protects an unlimited number of devices. Click the link in the description or go to piavpn.com slash toldenstone to get 83% off your PIA subscription. That's just over $2 a month and you also get four extra months completely free. In times of peace, Roman military engineers designed the permanent forts that housed the troops. These ranged in size from tiny emplacements with room for a dozen men to the mighty legionary bases, sized for 6,000. The largest forts were self-contained cities laid out with gridded streets and a central plaza, provided with everything from hospitals to baths and protected by up to three rings of walls and ditches. Through the first century, Roman forts were built of turf and wood. Legionary bases required whole forests of mature timber. 
by one estimate, about 400 acres of trees were cut to construct the fortress at Kerlion. Nearly a million nails, buried to prevent local tribes from using their iron, were discovered in the half-finished legionary fort at Inchtatil. From the 2nd century onward, forts were ringed with massive masonry walls. More than 60,000 tons of stone, cut and shaped by the soldiers, were used in the 2nd century reconstruction of Kerlion's perimeter wall. Late antique forts, with their massive ramparts and projecting towers, were even more imposing. Britain's Saxon shore forts were so solid that several were reused as medieval castles. Roman military engineers were also responsible for the vast network of highways that connected Italy with the far-flung frontiers. Despite their benefits for trade, the Roman roads were designed, first and foremost, to enable the rapid transit of troops in all seasons and all terrains. Amid the marshes of the Rhine Delta, for example, the swamp mud was mounded into causeways, stiffened with tens of thousands of pilings. Through the iron gates of the Danube, a highway was built along sheer cliffs, alternately cut into and cantilevered from the rock face. More impressive even than the road network was the vast chain of forts, watchtowers, and walls that protected the empire's northern frontiers. The system evolved gradually, becoming more substantial over the course of the second century. Although most sections, like the Limes along the Upper Rhine, consisted of a trench and palisade punctuated by watchtowers, some were nearly as impressive as the Great Wall of China. The most monumental section of the frontier was Hadrian's Wall, which ran 73 miles along Britain's northern frontier. About 15 feet tall and as much as 10 feet thick, it was studded with turrets and mile castles, guarded by a string of forts, and supported by a massive system of trenches and roads. The whole complex was built by detachments from the three legions stationed in Britain, with short sections assigned to individual centuries. Later in Roman history, military engineers designed forts as spectacular as any medieval castle. On the Syrian frontier, for example, Justinian built the great fortress of Zenobia, large enough to contain an entire planned town with a forum, bath complex, and two churches, and protected by a circuit of walls so massive that they remain almost intact today. Ambitious governors sometimes ordered the engineers in legions under their command to construct massive public works. During the reign of Claudius, the governor of Lower Germania built a 23-mile canal connecting the mouths of the Rhine and Meuse rivers. A few decades later, under Vespasian, soldiers from three legions and 20 auxiliary units were involved in the construction of a three-mile canal, complete with bridges, near Antioch. The Car Dyke in England, a Roman canal nearly 60 miles long, is thought to have been dug with legionary labor, apparently for the dual purpose of draining marshland and supplying the local troops with grain. Thanks to their wide-ranging expertise, military engineers were often requested as technical advisors for civilian building projects. Pliny the Younger, a provincial governor in the reign of Trajan, was sent a legionary surveyor to determine the feasibility of a planned canal. On another occasion, he requested the services of a military engineer to help salvage a collapsing aqueduct. Exceptionally skilled engineers were moved from legion to legion as their services were required and often called back to service after the end of their enlistment. One such man was Nonius Datus, a legionary engineer based in what is now Algeria. Around the middle of the 2nd century, his services were requested by the city of Saldai, which was planning a new aqueduct. The most difficult part of the project would be a tunnel some 1,400 feet long through a mountain. Datus traveled to Saldai, surveyed the aqueduct's course, and marked the place where the tunnel would be dug. Then, having instructed the local authorities to set teams of men working from both ends of the tunnel, he returned to his camp. Years later, Datus received a desperate letter. The aqueduct was still unfinished, and work on the tunnel had stalled after the workmen became disoriented and began digging in opposite directions. A legionary engineer was needed again, and so Datus, now a reservist, returned to Saldai. Along the way, he was waylaid by thieves, who beat him and stole his equipment. Undeterred, he proceeded to the job site, where he resurveyed the line of the tunnel, reorganized the work teams, and ensured that the aqueduct would be completed on schedule. When the aqueduct was finally done, Datus set up a monument in the legionary base at Lambasis, 
or his fellow engineers could appreciate his efforts. The inscription, which survives in part, detailed his work on the project and reproduced letters of praise from local authorities. Above the text were personifications of hope, efficiency, and perseverance. A Roman military engineer needed all three. My new book, Insane Emperors, Sunken Cities, and Earthquake Machines, is now available as a paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can buy your copy through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or your local bookstore. For more Told and Stone content, check out my channels, Told and Stone Footnotes, and Scenic Routes to the Past, which are linked in the description. Please consider joining other viewers in supporting Told and Stone on Patreon. Thanks for watching.